John, thank you for coming to the show. My pleasure. Always, always a pleasure to talk to you about our common love. Exactly. Well, that's the thing is, is, you know, obviously you're known for being an incredible drummer and you're obviously known for all the comedy stuff, but I think lesser known is the fact that you are one of the most knowledgeable people about music that I've ever met ever anywhere. Not to put too much on you. (laughs) I, I, for the longest time, I thought I wasted my, my, uh, teens and my twenties, just reading magazines and books, but it's paying off now. Well, I tell you, like, it, it's inspirational for me, like watching you go on a tour and actually doing like the field legwork to go to these places and see these like actual location that this stuff took place at. I, I'm, uh, you know, what? that's, that's, that's driving me. That's driving my archival knowledge as well. Well, I'm going to throw the gauntlet down. I, I, I challenge you to find a, a more worthless endeavor than, <laughs> than spending your day off in Pittsburgh, finding the gas station that stands where the theater that the sex pistols were supposed to play their first U S show stood. The show was canceled, of course, but I, I, I went there. That is amazing. That was going to be the first show. (laughs) Homestead PA. I have no idea why it was picked. They printed tickets even. Wow. That crazy. Yeah. And and then they, that didn't happen. and, And they went to, uh, Atlanta. Yeah, it's so weird, like the, the weirdest routing. Like, I guess they were flying, but someone had to drive that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, oh, but but here, here here's some weird rock and roll weirdness. The guy that was their tour manager, uh, Noel Monk, he was, I think he was like a, a Warner Brothers affiliated guy, does the tour, wrote a great book about it called 12 Days on the Road. And, uh, and then his next gig, he was kind of rewarded for putting up with the Sex Pistols on this tour with his next gig, which was Van Halen, who he ended up managing for, for their entire run. <laughs> wow. The Van Halen punk connections, like a lot of that stuff came out after Eddie's passing, but, you know, it's, yes. it's, they were really tied in. And that, that thing that I didn't know in, until very recently, that the, the straight the guitar thing was pretty much what what chip kinman was doing in uh i'm sorry to, uh yeah yeah chip kinman in, in the dills was uh he, he had a guitar that looked just oh, like that's that right. he does. I've seen before that. eddie van halen isn't that wild i had no idea about that i never made that connection but that makes complete sense because i guess they would have like you've seen the flyers like they played with the ramones and then when lauren from the dogs was on the podcast recently he talked about how they used to play together all the time with van halen so they would yeah. have been in the scene yep yeah on some level well, we get to talk today about uh, people that actually saw the Sex Pistols live at, yes. at some of these shows because the Go-Go's, the Foo Fighters, and I'm, I'm going to throw Todd Rugren as well going in there this year. And we have like a, a pretty strong punk class for this year's Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And this is not even including like Kill Scott Heron, who, who's, who was punk, Charlie Patton, yep. punk, you know. So, but we're talking, we're talking as Byron Coley would say, the P-Rock. So the let's, self-identified. Let's yeah. yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Like I, I, I kind of, you're right. There are definitely people that are punk in attitude, but these are the people that, you know, maybe not so much with Todd Rugren, but certainly with the Go-Go's and with the Foo Fighters, like all of these people uh, identified yeah. at one point as being punk. I'm just, I'm just glad that, that uh, at, as with, uh, with the MC5, the MC5 doesn't get in. But their producer John Landau does, and and uh, but of course it, it is John Landau's Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, so he 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 calls the shots. And the Dolls don't get in, but Todd yeah. Rundgren does. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Dude, it's better to be the producer. You always just want to get right. points off the record, not make the fun, record. Fun fact: My mother and Todd Rundgren went to the same high school and graduated at the Tower Theater. Whoa! Where the ceremonies were Isn't that crazy. That is very bizarre. Like, yeah. Like, did it would have been different times? I imagine. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my mom was in the uh, in the fifties somewhere. Yeah. Because he he definitely is a, you know, like I I think he was one of the first people I I remember kind of putting a face to a name of from records because he was in every music documentary that came out in the mid nineties. Yes. Like yeah. He he was always the head they went to when they had to talk to someone from the dolls. They're like, eh, let's just let's talk to Todd again. Yeah, 
they were okay. They couldn't play, but you know, I mean, he's 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 a wild guy himself. I mean, he's this is a guy. This is a guy that has done his own thing his entire life. Yeah, it's. You know? It's wild when you look at who's not in there, you know, and that's when it becomes like, like you're saying the dolls, the MC5, Bad Brains didn't get in. And it seems like once Devo. You, Devo. Devo didn't get in. Oh, yeah. Devo didn't get in this year. No. That is, it's, it's, it's such a weird thing where you're like, okay, well, this is the best music ever. And all this yeah. stuff that failed to get in during this little one window they had, eh, it's not really up on the level. And they had a genuine hit record, too. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and like it's it's arguable that they might have changed music more than just about any artist connected to yeah. punk or new wave. Yeah, Kraftwerk too. I mean, Kraftwerk's such an influential band, but they did get in, right? Did I? Did they get in this year? They got a special. Oh, they, uh, it's like a maybe special. They didn't. I think no. Maybe I think they, they got. I think they got a special commendation or something. There was like they got another set. Yeah. yeah, but okay. Fela didn't get in. Fela Cootie, you know, a guy nope. who <laughs> defined a. To right. find music from a from like a whole part of the world and and sorry, not this yeah. year, buddy. <laughs> Let's talk Go Go's. My one of my crucial bands from my youth. They, they are, got in, which is so nice. They, and they got to be like, uh, you know, for my money, one of the first you know punk rock supergroups. That's the that's a flag I've been waving recently because, you know, by the time they're already doing the Go Go's a bunch of them are already kind of like experienced musicians like Kathy oh, Valentine's yeah. already been in three bands and toured. Yep. Um, Charlotte was in the eyes with, uh, with DJ Jane yep. Drano. <laughs> <laughs> I love uh, it, Jane Drano. It's the greatest name ever. It, she, <laughs> she, she also like, have you gone back and reread all those like oral history of punk books? There, it's amazing how much they're in. Like we got the oh, neutron yeah. bomb and and uh, what we do is secret. Oh yeah, they were they were they were there. I mean, they were they were they were at ground zero. And just what's what's so great about them is that yeah, completely from that that weirdo punk world, but they could write songs. Mm -hmm. And you know, I mean, that's why we're talking. That's why we talk about all the great bands. They had great songs, and it's just. It, it's so cool that like these, I don't want to call them urchins, but like, they, you know, these were like, these were like gutter, <laughs> gutter kind of kids. And they ended up writing these amazing songs that we still talk about today. Yeah. Like, and I think people always, not always, but like, there's definitely like a, a tendency to underrate them as songwriters. But you have, the fact is you've got like three are four unbelievable songwriters in this band. And any one of them could yeah. write like, you know, and we're writing classic songs, like a bunch of these songs they're bringing from other bands. Yep. Yeah. And Gina Shock, one, I, I think one of the greatest rock and roll drummers of all time, definitely in my top, top 10 influences. I think she's just incredible. And, and she, I think she's what made them the great band that they were just in, in terms of like a band being a, a, a musical unit. Mm -hmm. No, they are, they are, uh, you know, such a, such an important band. And also they beat the damned to doing Chiswick and Stiff. You know, doing doing both labels, having right. both labels come together. Right. Yes. So the and, is, and, go on. Oh, oh, I I was gonna say, um, and you know, for them to have have the uh I don't uh, this is the, the worst possible word, the balls to go on the on those tours, you know, with madness over in the UK or the specials where playing to like just hardcore skinhead dudes every night and just taking whatever they were throwing at them. I mean, that's, that's pretty punk. I mean, that's, that's incredibly respectable. Oh yeah. Like that audience, like we've been actually talking about this a lot on, on footnotes recently, Chris O'Toole and I, because that audience for the specials and madness at that point must've just been the worst, you know, like yeah. Nazi ska punk fans or nazi skinhead ska fans are seems like seems like something from a sci-fi movie yeah yeah <laughs> the worst of all worlds the worst of every <laughs> world come together in one being <laughs> and they're and then also it's it's still at the point where like it's punk right and all these kids saw punk on tv so they're going out and spitting at the bands as well like it just seems those tours yeah. must have not been not been very fun yeah yeah just bad news but it's also amazing when you kind of like think about all the different lives 
they have even as a band right like they're they're an la punk band then they're kind of this like uk new wave band as this stuff's exploding over there and then they come back mm. to america and and change pop music forever yeah yeah i um i got to see them on every tour um oh. and they were great i i saw them uh some this, this incredible festival i think we probably talked about uh it was the day after my first ever gig i played a pl played a, a backyard party with with hair club for men my first band a and uh the next day we all all went down to this racetrack outside of philly so this is, this is august of 81 and um uh police headlined uh the specials maybe three weeks before they broke up um go-go's Boingo, Boingo, and, and opening the coasters. Oh, wow. What a we, <laughs> I don't think we talked and about this. I, I, I didn't find out until decades later. The reason the, coast, the coasters were, were on the bill, and, and they came out in these, like, green satin jackets, like, like yeah. they just played, you know, they, they're on the road. It turned out they played Miles Copeland's wedding, I think, the day before. <laughs> uh in new york so so i never knew that, like all these people were probably just massively hung over at this show a and uh so i guess i guess the coasters uh part of their deal was they folded in this gig opening for all these new wave bands the next day so this must have been a package tour because then the police came up here with pretty much the same lineup and did the police picnic the, in toronto the next day i think i think it was the next day oh wow so they i didn't know yeah. they did other shows around this thing I think it was just those two shows. The show in Philly was their only U.S. show that summer, and I assume it was the same in, in Toronto. Yeah, and the show in Toronto is also kind of legendary because there's also, you know, in the same way, not necessarily the coasters, but there's definitely, like, Nash the Slash, and I believe Desperate right. Measures, and, like, all these sort of, like, local, you know, Canadian Toronto new wave bands also got yeah. thrown on that bill. But how did they go over that show? Were they, they, were, they were already Did they already have a hit by that point? Yeah, they did. Go-Go's? Yeah. It was just taking off. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. They went over well. Definitely. Yeah. And, and the specials were just incredible. They were so good. Yeah. Cause they did, did they come back and do, cause I think they did a second police picnic in Toronto. Did they do a second one in Philadelphia or no? Um, no, I saw, I saw the police and the go-go's in January of, of the next year. Uh, and then uh they didn't they didn't do another one of those then uh so the go-go's the next year with a flock of seagulls <laughs> yeah. um and then with um on the final tour on the talk show tour with uh this is a solid bill you're gonna die when you hear this uh go-go's in excess opening up the hooters Yes. 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 <laughs> that is that is a very yeah. Uh, well, that's like the Hooters is is one of the all time and they're and they're so regional. Like the only reason I ever heard of them was because of you on the best show. Like I'd never yeah never they'd never come up before. I I did an interview about two weeks ago with the drummer from the Hooters, and he he was a very early influence. I don't really get nervous for interviews, but I was nervous for that. Cause I mean, he's like, he, he was a big deal for me and anyone who's older than me, I'm nervous in front of. Yeah, of course. <laughs> well, cause they're, they're still adults and you're just a exactly. kid at that point. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Like Foo, Foo Fighters now, <laughs> but the drummer for the Hooters, I gotta, I gotta, I gotta work up to this. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's, <laughs> but that is a big deal because it's also, it seems like the like local bands, it's something that, you know it has you have a different relationship to a local band like that you know like it, and it's the same way like talking to people you're gonna think this is ridiculous but the same way when you talk to someone from bakersfield california about corn mm -hmm. they just right. you grow up with this band so your relationship to it is completely different than anyone looking at it from the outside right right it's true uh, did so after um i'm sorry with the with the the go-go shows like at each time was the crowd kind of like the same or are they getting like a, a different crowd of these shows because you got to be like one of the few repeat punk customers the whole way through maybe yeah i um um they were just like my team that's what that's what i, th I thought of i still think of them like even though i like i i know i know jane and kathy now and like they're part of my my team my family like since mm -hmm. since since i was 14 and they will be till i die 
<laughs> and uh, um, but um, I think each time, like the time with Flock of Seagulls, it wasn't a huge turnout. It was at the Spectrum, you know, which is the was the big hockey arena, and um, I would say there's probably like six thousand, maybe. Yeah, it probably held fifteen, but um, so you know, it was uh. Vacation was the record they were touring, and and that had you know had, had a a hit on it. So there was there were young kids there, and, and then for for the talk show tour, that had had two, had at least one massive single too. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, so that was my memory of that. And because NXS was on it, it it, it was like a, a a melange of 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 different types. It seemed way more mainstream than the other shows I'd seen. In, in terms of, of crowd turnout. It's funny too with NXS because that's a band who obviously like here they, you know, like decidedly kind of like, I don't know, I don't know, like mainstreamy kind of rock, I guess, or something. But like you look at them in Australia and it's very similar to the Go Go's. Like they're they're kind of like much more from a punk world in in like a weird sort of connection way. Like they're on a Go Go right. records for their first single, I believe, even or mushroom records at least. Oh, I didn't know that. Wow. I didn't know that. And then wow. there's have you seen the documentary? <laughs> there's a documentary and it's the saints are all over it like it's just it's like the about like his relationship to the saints for a good 15 minutes of the documentary it felt like i've i've seen the one j- just on him uh i thought this was the whole band it? but it was i was watching on a plane there, and i was oh pretty, there is another one about the band which i've not seen okay that might have been this one that i was watching it was on like a flight wow. to australia so that's why I think it was on the plane, but I was on a lot of edibles. So my recollection sure. might be a little hazy. Maybe the saints weren't in it at all. And I just hallucinated Maybe. the whole thing. Maybe though. That's cool. <laughs> um, uh, where did you kind of hear the go-go's for the first time? Like it was just on the radio. I think the, uh, the first time I'd heard of them was, um, uh, via Dean clean, who is the drummer for the dead milkman. Uh, he, he was a few a few years older than me, and he he and he, he kind of took me under his wing when I was maybe fourteen or so. And, and uh, so he had this this band. It was a duo, uh, guitar and drums, uh, uh, called Narthex, a- and they would open for Hair Club for Men at the at these shows that we do at you know at um, the local Lions Club or the you know we the VFW Hall that sort of thing. And so so. Um, the, the other guy in the band was named Mike Ace, his real last name, A-C-E. A- and um, he was a big singles collector and he had the the uh, the stiff single. We got the beat. That, so that was the first time I, I heard it. And and then I, I think in preparation for that cool uh, festival, I, I I bought the album. I, I bought um, uh, Beauty and the Beat. It must have, I think that came out probably in, Let's see when did that come out? Uh, Eighty one. Like what? Uh, oh, uh, what, what month? Let, let's see. It's got. I, I'm. I'm at. Uh, I'll find it in a second here. This is where. This is where you. You. You put me to shame on your recall. No, here, like this. here we go. It was. Oh, it was. It was July. So it would have been like a month and a half before that. It came out uh, J- July eighth, and so um, I must have gotten the record just to kind of familiarize myself with with their music. And, um, and I loved it. I, I, I just thought they were great. And I mean, every song on that record is to me is a hit. Mm-hmm. And then you've got the, uh, Peter case co-writing that song tonight too. So you got some, uh, you got some nerves. Connection. Yeah. There. yeah. yeah. It's, it, that's what I mean. Like, like, it's such a, like coming together of, of like the scene, you know, the fact that you do have that nerves connection, you do have this germs connection, as we talked about, you have this connection, all the Texas stuff. And then, and then the, the danger house stuff, like all this stuff seems kind of like, I don't know, like I'm looking at it obviously separated by years and, and miles geographically, but like, it all does seem like it's kind of coalescing through the go-go's. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, um, no other band really, hit it that big out of that world really yeah. i mean like x x never had any like hit hits um plimsolls i mean was that a hit uh, a million miles away not like these hits right these are like no. these are like those hits that that like you're, you're my, my my parents know you know these are the hits that just right. transcend genre yeah yeah it's it's also like so 
weird when you kind of like think about how short this run is that this band has you know like you're you're they're going in with the foo fighters and a lot of people i've heard like being like oh why the foo fighters going in the foo fighters have had like a a 20 some odd year run the go-go's right. did all this in like four years five years four years yep yeah and <laughs> and i think part of it is is because it was five women i mean that really hadn't happened there had been you know, there been bands like fanny and 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 the runaways but but um no one really had this kind of massive success on on what, what I would consider their own terms. Like there was no, there was no Stengali, you know, in place. There was mm-hmm. like Miles Copeland was not writing these songs. You know, they they were doing it themselves and and um, you know, incredibly self contained. I think it's always weird how it's like it seems like every band that makes it, it's always the band that all the local people were kind of like not expecting it to happen with like yes. all the people around it. Like it really feels like a lot of vitriol being thrown at the go-go's in those punk history books. Right. But you know, it, it, it's, it's tough because they, they had the goods. They yeah. had the songs. Not that yeah. X didn't. I mean, X has some of the greatest songs of all time, but they're, they, ju- it's just not, it's not that same kind of appeal. Like you're not going to hear the hungry wolf on, on the radio. Yeah, no, exactly. And it, and it's like, it takes an artist that like is willing to to comp not compromise you know in any sort of like deep sort of like spiritual way but like to compromise their sound enough to kind of find a sound that doesn't just hit with people that are in the know but hits with everybody like right like you know like the dickies weren't going to do it <laughs> like it's also funny when you right? think about the bands that signed the major labels you got x who did it years later you have uh, the dickies and then you got the go-go's like it's really none of right. these other bands were signed to majors like in the same way that the new york bands were yeah and isn't there some kind of i feel like there's a connection between leonard graves and the go-go's was was maybe i feel like maybe charlotte dated leonard at some point something like that and i, I thought they even meant maybe wrote something but maybe not maybe not oh i wonder if they did at yeah. some point write yeah. something i don't know um, and I guess the, the other band that's, that's going in this year is the Foo Fighters who once again, to me, maybe not sound, doesn't sound like it, but really you do have like a Voltron coming together of like the Pacific Northwest hardcore scene, the LA first wave hardcore punk scene, the, I guess, post first wave discord stuff, the revolution summer discord kind of era stuff. And, and it's, and, uh. I think that's it. I think I've got them. Oh no! Wait, no, and you left, her name. You Epithet. left out the. You, you left out the biggest one. <laughs> the, oh, Nirvana, Nirvana too. The the fart blossom connection. Oh, the fart blossom. Yes, yeah, so Dane what, Bramage wasn't wasn't Dane Bramage on fart blossom? They were. Dane Bramage was absolutely. Thank you. I can't believe I messed up on that, John. <laughs> thank you for saving me on that one. Of course, fart blossom, one of the greatest record labels ever. You know, <laughs> like, right. and now there's going to be a mention of them in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like that's the thing to me about the Foo Fighters. It's all the all the other baggage that's being brought in there at the same time. Like, you know, for the first time ever, we have a band in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame featuring members that silk screened manila envelopes to put their records in. That's right. That had to happen, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. My my um my second punk rock show was uh I don't know if I ever told you. I think I think we talked about this. This is this is the uncoolest thing ever. I I saw the Quincy Punk episode. I think on a thir- on a on a Wednesday, and then I think the, the on Friday, I saw uh, the, the Dead Kennedys <laughs> uh, with Toxic Reasons, and then I think I think it was the next day or maybe the next weekend, Toxic Reasons, Scream, and a couple other bands at this dive in Philly, but I was at the mercy of the guy that drove me and he wanted to leave early and we didn't get to see, see scream. So I, I don't know. I don't know if Dave would have been in the band at that point. It, it would have been like June of 83. No, I think that's still before he joins. Cause he's only on the record that never came out, I think. And, oh. and the last record. Okay. Their, their last record that never came. out was actually supposed to come out on kind of like a weird Def jam offshoot. Mm. but it, it folded beforehand but and uh that's what he was left stranded out there and uh you know got the call after uh brian walsby according to legend which was a 
I've just kind of built up on the show over the years, uh, turned it down. And and, and I guess Dale did too. Oh, okay. Brian Walsby has always been one of my favorite drummers to watch. He, and I think he would admit this, I don't think he's ever broken a stick. It's <laughs> it, it's the greatest technique. Like he's, he, 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 it's not like he's a soft hitter, but the way he plays is like, it's so relaxing. Even, even though he's playing like punk and stuff, it's, I can't even describe it other than that. It's just like a very, very, um, soothing drumming style so i i think drumming I is i think well i think that's the thing it's like you can't appreciate drumming unless you're a drummer like i love sitting and watching another drummer play with jonah and he can kind of break down why bill stevenson is an amazing drummer to me like in a different way than i can appreciate as just a fan like in the same way that right. you're breaking down brian as a different kind of player than i would ever see you know, I'd be like, yeah, I never even thought about that. But yeah, that's pretty, pretty amazing for a drummer not to break sticks. Like it's, you got, you got to find a certain way to hit. Yeah. And, and um, I guess you could say that about every, everyone who plays an instrument, everyone has their own touch. They're, they're wired in a different way. Like listen to Dan Peters on, um, uh, what's he on sliver? Is that right? Mm -hmm. And it's just, and, and of course all the mud honey stuff. And, I can hear him and know immediately that's Dan Peters. It's just, he has his own thing and it's so different than what Dave does. And um, it's just very, it's an interesting thing that, that those two guys were in the same band. And to me, they sound really different too. In, in uh, they make the bands, they made Nirvana sound very different in both of their, their incarnations. Yeah, it's like funny because like I always think about this with the Melvins, like the bass player is kind of the perfect slot that you can bring someone in and out of because they will change the way the band plays, but not mm -hmm. in the same way that it will fundamentally completely change the sonics like a drummer will. Right, right. And Dale is, is you know, I mean, Dale to me is is that band in a way like I mean, his, his he, he's so singular in his style and sound that you just. I mean, it's inconceivable to, for him n not to play in the band. Ha have they ever done shows without him? Like, has he been sick or something? God, I'm trying to think. Well, they've done shows where Dale plays, because, um, like, the original drummer was not Dale, right? Like, on the very, very first demo stuff. Mm -hmm. And then Dale joined the band. So they've done, I think it's called Melvin's 83 when they do it. And oh, cool. Dale will, uh, will go to bass, and then they get the original drummer to come back and play interesting that's really cool wow yeah that band seems to have like a, a real kind of fun way of keeping it interesting for the people in the band too oh my god have you seen that that great documentary where where they, they play 50 states in 50 days I, I had it already queued up and then something happened i didn't watch it i have not gone back to it, but i need to watch that thing it's really fun and that version of the band is something weird also it's like um it's the two, you know, it's Buzz and, and Dale. And and the bass player, I think, is playing like an upright bass, or maybe even he's like playing it like a cello or something. It's <laughs> it's uh it's not like a regular bass. So uh it might even be even be called Melvin's Light or something like that. Okay, yeah. I remember they yeah. did the when they did Toronto, they did they came to Toronto one time on the small amps tour. And they'd all just oh, like the little I, tiny I amps. That, that <laughs> yeah. sounds great. It was awesome. It's just like, every, yeah, like, oh yeah, like you don't have to tour in a prescribed way. You can keep it interesting. No. In some they way. do it. They, they do it. They definitely do. And like a lot of connections, weirdly, with the Foo Fighters in that band. Like not just Dave getting, of course, the call to join Nirvana from them originally, but also like Nate's done some records, I think, where dale played on them and so there is like a lot of sort of i guess pacific northwest kind of connection right right and I, i'm gonna be honest I, I don't know a ton about the foo fighters but i know i know chris was in a in like one of those those uh those clicky kick drum bands right well chris has was also in a mystic band Oh my God! Which one? <laughs> he was in Rat uh, Rat Pack, but I think he was in when they became a glam metal band. You know, like all those bands eventually—not all of them, obviously—but like a lot of those bands eventually discovered the glam uh, problem and and got into glam, and they were one of them. And I believe that was the era he was in. But he told me, and I, I hope I'm not making this up, but I remember him telling me 
I think that he did record at Mystic Studios for some band when he was a younger kid. I need to know every element of any interaction with Doug Moody. <laughs> he's definitely, he's got to be in the Hall of Fame. Like that is definitely like why is there not a special award for that guy going in? <laughs> Who is the band? I, it has to be no effects. Who is the band that these guys had the greatest album titles of all time? Did they do? So what if we're on Mystic? Or is that yeah. somebody else? They did. They did. So what if we're on Mystic? And what's the other one? 53, it's like 52 songs that weren't good enough for our other albums. That's the greatest <laughs> thing ever. <laughs> but that's that. That's also going in with the Foo Fighters, right? You've got, I think, this is definitely the first Fat Records affiliated band going in. Yes. So we got a lot, John. We got the first Manila screened envelope sleeve band. We got the first Epifat artists going in. There's a lot. And also, I, I got to re. I, I might be mistaken on this, but also the first member of a straight edge hardcore band going in because Nate Mendelson, before, Nate Mendels, before he played in uh, Sunday Real Estate, uh, was mm -hmm. originally in Brotherhood, the one of the greatest straight edge hardcore bands ever. Were they were they from the Pacific Northwest? Yeah, they're from Seattle, um, and it also featured Greg from Sun. Oh, it just totally when say, raging. When I heard Brotherhood, I thought it was one of those bands that's like uh, Jim Wilbur from Super Chunk does this great imitation of a uh, of an actual on stage utterance he heard at at the Anthrax Gallery back in the early eighties. <laughs> this is this is this is for my brother Brian. Brian, this is for you, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> I think Brotherhood probably had some impassioned speeches like that going on on stage as well. Yeah. But the thing that I'm also fascinated by is like those kids did not like the grunge scene, did not like Nirvana stuff at all. Yeah. Like they thought right. it was kind of like Nirvana. They thought it was like Led Zeppelin -y and, and butt Rocky. And it was that's like, a kind of what I, yeah, that's what I thought too. I mean, really? I, 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 Pearl Jam, that stuff, it, it all seemed like, it just it, it didn't seem like too many steps away from like fog hat to me. <laughs> like I I just thought a lot of that stuff was it all it all seemed major label. Everybody was going for it. Like it, there didn't seem a I mean I I get that those bands came from Punk Green River etc. But it it always felt to me like there was way more. We want to be on the radio. We want to you know we want to like you said, be the new butt rockers or something. Yeah, definitely. It's so funny to think that, you know, all this stuff is kind of coming from the same place there. But then at a certain point, a bunch of people were like, yo, let's just, let's just go for it. And there's really like yeah. no model that they're following. Like, I guess maybe it's Jane's addiction, but like, had anyone kind of made it at that point enough to be like, okay, this could work. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. I, I didn't get that. Either. Nico case once said to, to me, <laughs> she goes, you were too old to be into Jane's addiction, weren't you? And she she was right. <laughs> I, 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 she was right. <laughs> well, then me too, John. I'm too old too. <laughs> it's amazing when Nico was on the show. She talked about seeing, uh, I think it's the Aurora Ballroom show. Nirvana played like one of those legendary, you know, Nirvana when they're kind of just blowing up locally kind of shows. Right. Yeah. And she talked about how it was like this sort of completely awesome transcendent show, and she was just like so moved yeah. by it. And then Nate was from the Foo Fighters was on the podcast. I'm like, do you ever see Nirvana? He's like, I think I did once at the Aurora Ballroom. And I'm like, oh, well, wow. what'd you think? He's like, I opened the door, looked in and said, oh, they're trying to be Led Zeppelin. Cool. And, and walked away. <laughs> yeah, I, I saw I saw them at the Cat's Cradle uh, on the Nevermind tour. It was, it was the week I joined Super Chunk and um, saw about half of it. And and I turned to the guy next to me who was like my age. And, and we both just kind of shrugged and was like, yeah, yeah, pretty good. And, and, and I think I left at that point. Like it was, I didn't, I don't know. I, I, I think I, since I'd already seen the Ramones and the Clash and the, the DC hardcore bands, it, it, it didn't, it didn't just knock me out. Like it did a lot of people for some reason. Did you like the wipers? Were you a fan of the wipers by that point? Had you heard them? I, I'd heard them, but, but uh, not a, a huge fan. No. Really, you don't like them even this day? I, I I probably haven't heard enough. We actually covered at a Sharpling and Worcester show in Portland. We did a a, a cover of a song <laughs> with the band, and I can't remember which, what song it was. <laughs> Nico, Nico actually picked the song for me. I can't remember what it was though. If you said it, it would ring a bell. <laughs> I'm trying to think what song that could be. That I have no idea though. That is awesome. 
I had no idea. What you guys every night? Because I know, I know uh, Tom likes the first record, right? He, you know, he's never mentioned the Wipers to me. Come to think of oh, it. Oh no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I meant Nirvana. Sorry, I, I, I jumped back. To oh, Nirvana. he loves. Yes. Oh, oh my God. He reps so hard for 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 that that uh, uh, for Bleach, and um, he's. I think he saw them at at least once or twice at Maxwell's with uh, with Chad and um, Chad. Who was the fourth? Uh, who uh, was uh? Well, the fourth. There were four piece at one point. Yeah, I'm trying Wait, to remember the guy, yeah. Mike. Uh, Chad Channing. The other guitar player. What's his name? Um, I feel like it begins with an N. Maybe not. That's why I thought Mike, maybe, but maybe I'm wrong on that. I love that we're talking about possibly the biggest band <laughs> of, uh, of you know, of however many decades, and we don't, we know so little about them, or I do. <laughs> I know I, I, you know what? I, I was never as big a fan. I think I became much more of a fan of them in, in sort of recent years than at the time. Like all my friends were super into them. Uh, right. but just on a contrarian spirit, I was like, ah, nah, nah. Yeah. But I think uh... as time has gone on, I've, I've kind of like, I can see it now in a way that I couldn't before. Oh, Pat Smear was of course in the band J- for a while. Jason, Jason Everman. Jason, Jason Everman that's it. Was- yeah, he was he was in very briefly. I guess he was second guitar. Um, where did he? Well, he's like a oh yeah, that's he's the one who became a special forces guy. I think so. Yeah, yeah. After playing in Mind yep. Funk. Oh yes. <laughs> it's just like I, I can't do this anymore. I gotta I gotta join the army. I gotta I can't get a, be around Mind Funk. <laughs> now, who was Mind Funk? Mind Funk wasn't like out from the ashes of of uh, of. Uh... Oh, what's the band that had the biggest fall? Uh, the Straight Edge band, Uniform Choice. Yes, is that it? It is Pat DeBar from Uniform Choice. Yes. Oh, I, I, I would, I would read a five hundred page book about about Uniform Choice, have, <laughs> still having never heard them. <laughs> You've never heard them? I don't think so. Oh, I love that band so much. But when Chris Murphy was on the show, he ruined them for me because he's like, yeah. <laughs> I always hated Uniform Choice because the vocals to me sounded like someone sending an SOS message. No, 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 no. And then when they these photos of them in 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 their their latter day staring at the sun era, yeah. These flowing shirts and, and they're wearing shoes, like shiny shoes. It's just the greatest. And they're playing at like city gardens in in probably playing playing with like I don't know. Uh, gorilla biscuits or, or uh, who knows you know and just kids hating it it's so I, great i wonder what it would feel like to be you know one of those bands on that tour and just know like oh boy kids are gonna fucking hate this not to be discharged coming to america you know being right. like oh man <laughs> yes. people are in for a rude yeah. awakening on this trip at the at the farm in san francisco yeah, yeah. oh there's a bootleg of that i think that came out recently where it's just... yeah it's crazy it's so good <laughs> i oh i my think God. i kind of admire that now like i think you know at the time of course I, I you know i looked at all those bands and all those records being like oh that's garbage but now it's like to be a band like that and just be like you know what let's just throw it all away let's just yeah ruin it for everyone yeah yeah it, and my understanding of uniform choice is like that they were really popular too. Like they could have, they could have like popped nationwide it, had they, had they kept going in, in that, that kind of minor thready straight edge direction. Yeah. yeah like they had like, you know, there's the, obviously those shows out in California, they, they sometimes would play to like 600, 700 people type thing. And they, yeah. you know, prior to youth of today and that whole stuff popping off they were like sort of the big i guess national straight edge band like the first one out there yeah and they connect super heavy to that scene too like youth today and all the uh the california stuff but like you know once again now we have a straight edge representation in the rock and roll hall of fame through the foo fighters but even though Finally. nate wasn't straight edge at the time and they wouldn't let him be considered an official member of the band because he wasn't straight edge and because he wore a no effect shirt i love it yeah they... I, I i love little rules like that 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 <laughs> that are, are ironclad also <laughs> yeah greg apparently when nate was on the show he said that greg uh asked him like hey okay you want to be in brotherhood 
And he's like, yeah, it's like, okay, well, you're not an official member because you're not straight edge <laughs> because you, you got a no effect shirt on. And they made him take off the no effect shirt before a gig one time and change it apparently. Was was he on a record? And if so, was he listed as, be, as being a member? No, he's listed on like the on this recording Brotherhood is, and he's listed as the player on that part of the record. Wow. Oh my God. <laughs> but not the other. Yeah, it's definitely That's right. And I think he wasn't allowed to do the tour because he wasn't I I'm now I might be putting words into it, but there was a lot of a lot of uh restrictions put on poor Nate with Brotherhood at some point. Oh, um, and then also with the Foo Fighters, we got a, a germ going in too. And so this is like, as you and me were discussing off air, two potentially three germs going in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame yes. be- <laughs> because Charlotte did fill in um, for Lorna on a couple gigs for the germs. Yep, and Belinda what is said to be the the first drummer. Yep, and then of course Pat Smear going in as yes. well, which is. Uh, I kind of feel like this is obviously as close as we're going to get. You know, the fact the MC5 isn't in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, I don't think I'm going to hold my breath for the germs getting in. But this is as close as I think we're going to get to a germs Hall of Fame year. I I think you're right. But I I think next year we could look forward to, if 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 not Dave Marsh being uh, inducted, uh, <laughs> at, at least one or two members of the E Street Band road crew. <laughs> exactly. Was, yeah. it, uh, was Joan Jett inducted already? I think she was, yes. Well, yeah. then the germs producer's in, and the germs aren't, so <laughs> it holds. Oh, my God. How are the MC5 not not in? It's it's insane. And the dolls. It, it seems like it's harder to get into than, like, the Baseball Hall of Fame. Because it like, seems on that thing you get a couple years that you're on the ballot. But for this, if you don't get in on your ballot year, forget about it. Like, no one, no one's right. bringing it back on there again. I, I was listening to a really good interview with... Um, this San Francisco rock critic, Joel Selvin, who's written some good books over the years. And um, he was talking about how he had his, uh, his voting privileges removed uh, <laughs> because he kept voting for, you know, like he, he, he would vote for Charlie Patton. He would vote yeah. for, you know, for people that were, were considered just too old. Like they wanted to, the hall of fame really wanted this to be more of a contemporary thing and uh he just said one day he he, he got a, a letter saying he wasn't a voter anymore <laughs> sorry you spoiled your ballots too many times yeah, that, yeah. that's how democracy works <laughs> you didn't yep. you didn't vote the way you should have yeah. uh it's well it's just it's so you know and obviously i'm very excited for this because these you know especially in the case of the go-go's like i'm I'm happy that these bands are being celebrated and like like yes. we said like they're going to be appreciated now as songwriters hopefully um a little bit more by certain people but at the same time like yeah like to to have like a building that's for all of music the best music from all over the world and only five people can go in per year it's right. going to be a lot of oversight yeah <laughs> I, uh, I, I definitely, I don't know. I think from now, I, I think this is going to be the, the year. Cause I can't think of, you know, like, it's not like, as you said, like there's not bands that are bigger than this, you know, that are going to be coming up until you get to the Nirvana's, I oh, yeah, not Nirvana's right. or I guess like green days and offsprings. Well, one, one big one that didn't make it. And I was really surprised that they didn't make it iron maiden, but possibly like one of the biggest bands in the world for the last 20 years. Yeah. You know, how, yeah. how, how did they not get in? But Motorhead's not in there too, right? Like they just hate metal. Yeah. Is Sabbath in? Black Sabbath has got to be in there, right? I, I think so. Yeah. And the Sex Pistols turned it down? Yes. Yeah. <sighs> you you want to hate that band, but they keep doing things that are just you know, like, yeah, right on. These hear these guys being like, oh, yeah. <laughs> let's still turn this thing down. But you know, Glenn Matlock was so bummed about that. There's no <laughs> way he didn't he didn't want to do that. <laughs> you just got to wait for the rich kids' year. The rich kids are going to have their year eventually. That's right. Oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> and then, then he's going to be in or or the Spectres. I think was his band after that. But yeah, no. It. If I imagine for, you know, I imagine may, probably not everyone in the band was consulted on that decision before the press release was sent out. Oh, oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah. When they put you in, do they put you in with, like, your whole lineup, or is it only, like, a certain given lineup? It's apparently really random. Like, uh, uh, Kiss 
uh, begrudgingly was let in a, a few years ago. And, you know, they, they've had all these members forever, you know, like they, mm-hmm. they had got, they've had guys in the band who've been in way longer than the original four, but it was just the original four. And then you've got like, um, Oh, there was someone just recently where like everybody who was ever in the band got in. It's so weird. Like, I, yeah. <laughs> like, I, I wonder if the band gets a decision if they contact the, like the corporate entity entity of the band and they're just like, yeah, only, only these people are going in for this. I thing. think you're told, I think you're told who, who, who's going in. And uh, like there, there was something with deep purple where, where, Maybe the guy that sang on their first couple hits, which were big hits, like Hush and something else, he didn't get in. No. Yeah. Yeah. And I think I think Black Sabbath was only the four, like Ronnie James Dio didn't get in, which is understandable. But I mean, but they they were big with him, too. Has Joy Division ever been nominated in New Order? Or they, I wonder if they put them in together. I can't imagine. I mean, can you yeah. imagine Eddie Trunk, Eddie Trunk seeing that on a ballot? <laughs> and, and, and like, I mean, I, I was amazed. He, he, Eddie Trunk. For, for those who don't know, Eddie Eddie Trunk is this New Jersey per, DJ personality guy who he's like the the last man standing uh, holding the hair metal flag. Yeah, and and he he uh, he puts in the work. I give it to him. He puts in the work, but. Um, so he he posted his ballot the other day or, or a, a few weeks ago, and I was amazed he did vote for Devo. So uh, anything's possible. I guess it, I guess like you know even he has to admit that you know I'm shocked they didn't get in. I'm like that's that is I didn't even think about that till you know you you said it, but like oh that's so weird. Yeah, like there's not going to be Devo, and like I guess you know it makes sense the Go Go's going in, but I can't think of other new wave bands that are going to are B fifty twos in there yet. I can't imagine. Yeah. Like, I guess no, no one else would be going in. No, of, of all those bands, Devo, Devo seems to be the one because like, no matter like who you, who you are of a certain age, like, you know, Devo, like my mother knows Devo and she's mm-hmm. 80, 84. She's heard of Devo. And, and uh, um, but yeah, you, you're not going to find a, another band. The pretenders are already in. Um, yeah who else it's wild that the, you know it's it's the pretenders going in before any of these other bands too but yeah i guess i guess they had more kind of like hit hits yeah and neil young inducted them so i mean that's that's major too yeah. um and um that's the next question who's gonna induct these people <sighs> yeah uh Got it. Like, there's so many people that would be hilarious to think about inducting. I just, hope Tom, I just hope Tom Morello's in there at some point. I'm sure. I'm sure they just have like a, a speed dial. They're like, <laughs> yo, you're, you're around. You're free this weekend. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> we need you. You know, I'll, has Rollins ever done an induction for someone? I don't think so. I think, uh, I mean, he would be the guy for. Now I'm wondering if he might have done. Has Iggy been in as himself and the Stooges? I think, I think the he Stooges. might be double. Really? I wonder if he. I don't know. Twice. I don't know. That would be know. so incredible if Iggy pops in it twice, and like the MC right. Five isn't in it at all. Yeah. And all well, the weird other... one, the weird one also is he. He's and he's not in. You know he. I think the Sto- the Stooges were inducted, and I do think that Scott Thurston, who who was the latter day was he a bass player or a guitar player in the stooges um i think he might have played guitar right bass. or did he play bass after what he, or something I, i'm thinking it no this is before that oh I before the course been, yeah i think he might have been the bass player when james williamson in, in that era possibly okay. so he got in with the stooges and then he's he was also a member of tom petty and the heartbreakers <laughs> and and he he definitely played with Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers at their induction, but I don't think he got inducted with with them. But that that's two very different bands to be to be in there with. I, I think that's pretty cool. Yeah, I wonder I wonder how many other people have two entries in there as well, like two uh, double placeholders in that thing. Because yeah, I don't know. There's so few people getting so few people getting in. It's it's uh, 
Wow. Yeah, I wonder I wonder if Rollins. I'd love to see Jerry A induct the Go-Go's. Can you imagine? It would be awesome. He pulls a blade job at the podium while yeah. inducting him. Oh my god. Uh, I assume I assume Billy Joe will induct the Go-Go's. That makes sense. Or yeah, because do they have they never have past winners do it, right? Oh, I don't know. That I don't know. I, I wonder if you get like like Phoebe Bridgers or someone like younger to induct the, mm-hmm. the Go Go's. But you're right. right, Billy Joe just seems like someone who would be on their radar. Yeah. And just like, hey Billy, you like the Go Go's? Then you had like the replacements were on, on the ballot one year. Yeah. Has Husker do ever been on the ballot? No, no. What? And that's the one. It, it's so interesting because, like, both those bands, super influential. I would say Hooskers were maybe even a little more influential in, in, in some way. Definitely. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Like, I guess they didn't have, like, that, that like, kind of, like, alt-rock radio single right. type thing. But, like, yeah. just in terms of, like, album output and stuff like that. Well, you yeah. already, you know my feelings on this issue. I'm very partisan. I think anyone that's listened to this podcast knows my feelings on this issue. But, like, yeah, I would, I definitely agree with you on Husker Do being, like, like so influential, like just beyond the scope. Yeah. But uh, that's, uh, that's <laughs> now, now has black flag ever been on the ballot? I doubt it. I doubt it, but that's, that's a good one too. I mean that I can't think of a more influential band of that thing, you know, hardcore, whatever you want to call that. Uh, I'd love to see what lineup gets inducted. It would be amazing if it's like Mike Valelli, the, the when they had the the computer that played bass because they didn't get a real bass player, so they just had like yeah, a yeah, a bass yeah. machine. <laughs> yep, Dale Nixon, get in there. Yeah, <laughs> well, I had a friend from Toronto who took a bus to Los Angeles to go to that reunion, and that was like you know in the in the heady days where before the internet was really you know like the big thing it is now. So you you didn't have a lot of information, so you're just relying on word of mouth. And it's like it's oh, everybody, Rollins. everybody Everyone. in the band's gonna be there. Yeah, they're all gonna be there. Oh. Rollins oh, is there, no. <laughs> and he gets I there. Gi- <laughs> <laughs> oh. I give Greg Ginn credit for coming up with the the worst possible way to do that. Like normally, you would have the drum machine, like the. The drums are pre-recorded, but to have the bass be the thing that's pre-recorded, <laughs> like it's just an invitation for massive, massive fuck ups. And it's also like, like there's no one you can find. It seems like though no. finding a bass player seems to be the big issue because that was also that kid that answered answered that ad on Craigslist and ended up oh, auditioning. That's such a good one. Yeah, was it? Yeah. He was he was auditioning to be the bass player as well. So it seems like that's a hard position for that band to fill. Yeah, can you imagine? Oh. It'd be amazing if that kid went in, like some kid who went to one random audition with that band on face. Gre- yeah, Gre- Greg a- Anthony uh, on on drums. Um, Mike Valelli on vocals, or Mike, yeah. <laughs> he was a he, and then he left for a while, and I think he was just managing the band, and that's when um, uh, Ron Reyes came in and started singing for them again. Ah, oh, okay. And okay. they did that album with the the artwork. There's so many great lineups. Like that would be an amazing thing just to see the backstage. Like I would love to hear the backstage stories of like the Ramones all having to be in the same room again together. Oh my god, can you imagine <laughs> poor poor Monty having to having to deal with that? Oh, <laughs> just oh, oh just, n- night nightmare. Yeah, just the uh, well. That was also the that's the Johnny Ramone. God bless Do- uh, George Bush. Moment. God too, bless jo- George George Bush. <laughs> <laughs> and then Dee Dee, thank you, Dee Dee. I love you. <laughs> <laughs> and then you see the you see footage of that night, you know, uh, in in the end of the century, the the documentary, and they're it's about the film's about to end, and they're they're having a celebratory thing in in a very night, you know, pr- probably in the Waldorf Astoria, and. and uh, and they scan the room, and there in the middle of it is Jerry only in full outfit. <laughs> I just love it. Just just showing up, pumped up, did, did his push-ups, his, his reps, and then and then went. Put the gear on. Flew had to fly the with the gear on. too and his luggage and everything yes. too. 
Yeah. Um, I was actually watching his uh his he did a wrestling match against this wrestler, Doctor Death Steve Williams, and mm-hmm. a- according to legend, uh, he was at he's in the bathroom and he's peeing, and Doctor Death comes in and he turns and he goes, Doctor Death, I'm really happy to meet you. I want to shake your hand, and uh, Doctor Death just looks down at his hand. He's like, I'll mm-hmm. see you in the ring, brother, and then just yes. went out and just was not not very kind to jury only <laughs> right oh my god it, it it is uh you know i i think that that makeup is is also like a suit of armor at a certain level yeah. and so but th- that's also a band i mean yeah is there is is there a more influential band than the misfits at this point uh, uh, in that in that world i wonder if it's like one of those things where it's just not on you know like the, on the radar not on the radar yeah like these people just yeah. don't see it because like yeah the misfits just played sold out stadiums <laughs> like on yeah. their return you know and it's not like fugazi will ever get on the ballot no. or they'll bring him fugazi maybe bikini right. kill i could see that happening maybe um i'm trying to think of like some other like that kind of world of artists but I don't know. This might be the, this might be it, John. This might be the punkest year ever. My, it, it, unless Marginal Man uh, stages a comeback, <laughs> we'll see. Well, this this I hope just starts the the watershed for all the bands on Ebullition. Let all the bands, let the bands that silk screen paper towels as covers for their seven inches get in there. That's it. Yeah. So. Hey, you know the uh, uh, the crew just came out in some sort of uh, gatefold format, so maybe that's going to put uh, put seven seconds in the in the uh the view of, of the voters we'll see the new wind wing like a whole <laughs> wing just dedicated to i guess rage against the machine will probably go in at some point right oh yes i think so yeah so that will also allow like that'll be southern uh california straight edge going in at that year yes. so we've got a couple more a couple more years to celebrate this kind of stuff but yeah like it's it's so i can't believe devo didn't go in and I guess the Runaways must be in, or Joan Jett must be in. I think she, it's own. just her. I don't. Th- I don't think the band is in there. Man, I, I gotta go. To, have you been? I've been a few times. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's always fun. Like I, I love artifacts and things. Yeah. I, so I, I like. I like to see that stuff. But um, um, and my friend w- Warren Zanes, who was in the Del Fuegos, he uh, he was kind of the um what would you call it he, he was like a a director there like he was kind of in charge of it for for a while in the uh maybe in the late 90s or the early 2000s or something so i think he was my little connection there um so uh that's yeah, awesome it's fun. It's fun. I, heard, I heard you can go to it for free as a musician like a touring musician that sounds right yeah and they and i think bands play in it too like they have a, a stage out front and and you play um but it's got it, it, it's got uh, Paul Paul smashed bass or it did, which I know you uh, would love to see. Paul, I would Simmons. love to. I would love to see that artifact. You know, I. You know, what's so funny? You, um, because you know that guy Brian Ray Turcott. Do you know Brian? He did that book. No, fucked who's up that? He he's got. Oh, with, fucked up a photocopy. Yes, yeah. Yeah, and he's got yeah. without a doubt. Like, if there's a punk rock hall of fame, he's got mostly exhibits in his possession right now. Like, he's got johnny thunder's leather jacket from the back of the new york dolls record he's got like wow. an autograph coaster from the queen's jubilee uh cruise ship wow. show signed by sid vicious <laughs> like wow just most in, in incredible uh just it's just the level of stuff this guy has and he the other day he posted on his ig uh paul's bass all smashed up in this case and I'm like, did he somehow acquire this for the Rock and Roll? Oh my God! Or something? Wow. <laughs> so I don't know if they're moving it or if he just, you know, saw it somewhere. But yeah, he's got, you know, that's what I, that's what I'm most excited about. This is because there's going to be some pretty cool artifacts in a place like this from the Go Go's and stuff like that. So, right. you know, it's now, you know, going there and being able to see all these sorts of things, and you know, they're going to make reference to some of these old bands, like the Tech Stones. The Tech Stones might yeah. be referenced in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame now. Uh, I think so. So, well, John, this has been awesome. And anytime you want to come back and I can just learn and leech off your knowledge, please know, you know, you, you, you are the inspiration for this thing. It goes, it goes both ways. Awesome. Just stopping.